So silver point is an ancient drawing method that very few people even know of, much less know how to do. So scribes used it in the ancient world to take down inventories, then it was used to lay out illuminated manuscripts in medieval Europe, and then during the Renaissance it was used in workshops. Um, graphite pencils are relatively modern, so before graphite pencils became the big thing in the 17th century, or I should say 16th, you had charcoal, pen and ink, and metal point, which quite simply is just a piece of metal wire and a stylus. And it was really economical because whereas paper was rare also, you just needed one small panel like this, and then you would use usually your own spit and ground animal bones, rub it on, and then you could draw with a stylus, which could last for years. And then when you were done with your drawing, sand it off, reapply the coat, and it was a great training method in the old workshops and studios of Renaissance Europe to teach these little six or seven year old apprentices essentially how to draw because you can't erase it, you can't remove the line. So you have these kids sitting there with panels in an inerasable medium learning how to draw at the same age that most kids in the United States are learning how to read. So you can only imagine the neurons that were firing. But the key to silver point is what I mentioned about the spit and the animal bone, neither of which are terribly PC, but have nice modern components. So you can't just take a piece of metal and make a mark on a paper. You have to prepare the surface. But you should have a traditional gesso using some sort of binder and then some sort of pigment or something abrasive. You essentially want to create a brittle surface that a piece of metal can kind of etch into, slice into almost. And that leaves you with one thin individual line, which usually cannot be removed. So in order to do that, you have something that the TSA absolutely loves seeing go through airport security. And you have to have some sort of device to keep a traditional gesso warm. This is a crock pot I got off of Amazon Prime into which I wired an electronic temperature monitor. So that way your traditional gesso can stay at its preferred state of 125 degrees. If you pack this in a suitcase with a bunch of white pigment next to it, you're going to get stopped. So this is animal hide glue, most commonly rabbit skin glue. These are the grains. They often vary in size and shape from country to country, manufacture to manufacture. You have these soak overnight in a very specific ratio that creates the binder for your gesso, which then you put into whatever contraption you have. I used to do this in a double boiler on a stove top, which was terrible, and into which you then put your ingredients. It's actually not that intimidating. I think it's a lot easier than making a traditional oil gesso for, joy for oil paintings. Because once you have that correct ratio of the rabbit skin glue or whatever kind of binder you want to use, this is not necessarily vegetarian or vegan friendly, um, and water, you can kind of add anything to it. It's like soup. So you can add pigment, you can add marble dust, you can add bone ash. As long as you have that binder base, that metal will make a mark. So the pigment that I prefer for the traditional gesso or ground, I use the words interchangeably that I make, is from Kramer, it's zinc white, or traditionally Chinese white, which is a white pigment that was originally used in Chinese porcelain. And what I like is it has a putty-like texture that makes the incision of the stylus a little bit more tangible and flow more easily. So when you add your pigment, essentially all you're doing is thinking of milk. Do you want your ground or gesso to be the consistency of skim, low fat, whole, regular cream, it's up to you, it depends. The thinner it is, the more coats you will need. The thicker it is, the lesser coats, but you'll have to be very careful to make sure that it dries completely between each one because you don't want things to crack. It has the same exact philosophy as painting and oils, fat over lean, fat over skinny. You really want to make sure that everything is thoroughly dried with this. A lot of people use commercial products. A lot of those do a really great job. But I personally think that there's a reason why this sort of ground in gesso has survived and why egg tempera painters even still use it today. It's archival and it really is the best thing for receiving this medium, even though it is time consuming. So you add your zinc white, 
You also can add a little bit of bone ash um, and that adds just a little bit more abrasion to the ground so that the silver gets a darker value. Silver point is usually very light and limited in its value range, but a good traditional gesso gives you a lot more flexibility in terms of how you can render and how dark you can get your darks. Some people also add marble dust. This would be going in the line of making a more traditional chalk gesso. I don't do that quite so often, but I do sometimes like to add it's just really pretty um, pigment and then you can tint to your ground and then if you do what I do and add gilding later something like a blue tinted ground with a copper leaf or something laid on top is really really lovely so as you can see Kramer pigments is like my preferred go-to they've gotten a lot of my paychecks at this point so and it's just like cooking and the irony is I don't like cooking but I don't mind making this ground so in terms of the bone ash, you might add, it depends on how you like the ground. That's the thing, it's, it's really flexible. You can't really screw it up that much. If you've got the rabbit skin glue that's been dissolved in the water, you can just make it into a, 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 a pre-Renaissance soup. So I'm going to put, just because this recipe is a little bit less than the one I usually do, I'm going to have it and put just two tablespoons in there. And you mix that in first because the bone ash tends to be a little bit chunkier. So you don't want to put that in after you have the pigment because you want it to dissolve more quickly. And as I said, you want the ground to maintain itself at 125 degrees. And then I'm going to add my white pigment I'm going to be health conscious. And I should wear gloves too, but I don't have any right now. And then you just add as much as you want. It's, you really don't have to be that precise. So that was quite a bit. And I'm going to go for the consistency of whole milk. So, the zinc white also produces a warmer toned ground. Titanium white you can also add. That's going to make it nice and cool, but it will feel a little bit different to your stylus. And while the line work is akin to etching, it's not a more subtractive process. You're, you're depositing the silver on the surface of the drawing. So I could even take my, my wedding ring, which is platinum, and ideally be able to make marks in a surface just because of the reaction between the metal and the ground. What I've also done is I've sealed this wooden pallet, which will be my drying surface, with two coats of just the rabbit skin glue on the back and one on the front to seal it, and then I sanded it very thoroughly. Sanding is important because when you start to apply the ground, the particles will kind of fight with the wood underneath and try to come up into the surface and make things kind of disruptive. And then I like a really nice hockey brush. It doesn't have to be anything expensive. You see kind of how watery that is, like milk. Maybe I'll add a little bit more. That's just a little watery yet. The other thing is zinc white is a fairly transparent pigment, so often you need more coats. And that is time consuming because then you have to go back every 20, 25 minutes or so after each coat has dried and reapply another one, sanding in between. However, if you want to make a silver point drawing and you want a really good, historically accurate, archival feel for what you're doing, a traditional ground like this really is the way to go. Silver point drawings also are not messy once you start doing them. There's no residue, there's nothing lifted up. It's a very clean way of working that should make any New York landlord very happy. So, all right, now this is a little better. And you can kind of see a little bit of the pigment collecting at the end of the bristles. You can kind of see a little bit of steam even coming up from the ground as it stays warm. Okay, 
So then you apply the ground. You don't want to load your brush up too much. And you want to keep your brush constantly moving. Some people will stand a brush like this and let it drip onto the surface. No, 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 no. Because then you create puddles that will never, ever, ever dry. So you want to keep the brush going as seamlessly and as smoothly as possible. I usually don't coat the sides or back of this panel or any panel with this kind of ground just because this ground is fairly absorbent of skin oils. So obviously you're not going to be putting your hands all over the surface that you're going to draw on, but for handling I would keep the sides and back at least free of the pigment even though preferably sealed with just the rabbit skin glue and gesso prior to applying your first pigmented coat. So see, it's really not scary. I was very intimidated by the thought of having to make my own gessos and things. Um, but the more I started doing it, the more I realized you can kind of play around with it. And there's a reason why all of these pieces from, you know, 14th century Siena have survived because of this, because it's durable, it's really hard. It's a double-edged sword with traditional gesso and any sort of animal hide binder because it's really, really brittle, which means that once I'm done priming this, I'll probably have to brace the back of it to prevent warping. But on the other hand, that also gives it a durability. It's impervious to sunlight, so you can put something directly in front of a window or any light source, and it'll be fine. It'll never fade. So it's hyper-permanent, hyper-permanent. So that's one coat. You can see it's still pretty transparent. So then you have a surface like this, which has received about four or five coats. And you can see it's starting to get covered up pretty well. I've sanded it thoroughly between each coat. And then you just simply apply another. And each coat should be perpendicular to the one before it. And yeah, you can spend a whole weekend making these panels, but there's a big difference between the surface of something like this that you've prepared yourself and a commercial product, even though commercial products tend to make for more portable, quickly prepared surfaces. So then you just keep repeating until this eventually becomes more like that and then both become an opaque white. That might be five to six coats, that might be 10 to 12, depending how much pigment you put into your ground. And uh, then you have your drawing surface for Silver Point, and it's infinitely preferable to Chinino Chinini's preferred abrasive ground bone and tons of spittle. So that's how you make a traditional ground in an apartment in Queens. <laughs>